I think that this, this transgressive behavior that you're describing is part of the all-out assault on Western categories of thought. And I think that that was started not even so much by the Marxists as by the French intellectuals of the late 1960s, especially Jacques Derrida, who maybe is the most dangerous person of the last 40 years. He basically has made the claim that thought itself is an agent of oppression. Maggots don't make corpses. They feed on them. And that, that's absurd, except that he's the dominant thinker. Yeah. And, and I don't think people, I know people don't understand how radical and transgressive the universities actually are and how deeply embedded mm -hmm. this sort of thinking is in them. And this gender issue is a screen as far as I'm concerned, and it's a screen for, which is why it's got so much attention. It's a screen for an all-out assault, and that assault started back in the late 60s. It, it started when the Marxists transformed themselves into postmodernists. Gender issues are a screen for postmodern and Marxist power grabs? I disagree, Professor Peterson. I believe what we call Marxism and postmodernism is a throwback to archaic Bronze Age social systems. Actually, I could go even further and attribute both to domestication syndrome, but that's a video for another day. In my opinion, feminism is not a smokescreen. It's the most visible aspect of the driving force behind the chaos we see in our society today. Before we begin, I'd like to thank our patrons and supporters for enabling us to offer our content for free. Our supporters are the reason we have a fighting chance to talk about these issues in the way that we do. So if you love our content, think we can make a real difference and you're not currently supporting, I'd like to invite you to ask yourself why and send the answers to why at feedthebadger.com. And if you ask yourself why you don't support us and the answer is, well, why not? I'll be giving you an option to support at the end of this video, if you're interested. I haven't watched or read everything Professor Peterson has produced, so if he's updated his opinion on gender issues being just a screen for postmodernism and Marxism since the time that he said this, please inform me in the comments below. All right, let's get down to business. Professor Peterson, You've spoken before about how Christian values underpin our secular democracy. And you're right, they do. But where did those values come from? Christianity began its life in the social values of Rome's founding families. For example, the Christian emphasis on morality being innate to the individual rather than mediated by tribal affiliation. To use an example, lying is lying even if you do it to someone outside your tribe. In fact, Western systems of secular democracy, in particular the British and the American system, with its emphasis on checks and balances, owes more to Roman politics and Roman character than any other system of government. In Rome's ascendancy, it was a democratic republic, with an emphasis on a never-before-seen type of egalitarianism. First, the patricians form a senate when the king was deposed, and then the more numerous plebeians formed the People's Assembly to, to provide checks on the power of the Senate, and then the men of the even more numerous headcount started to gain political power. There was an overall trajectory in Rome to regard all men as equal and equally deserving of a say in politics. In other kingdoms of the time, the order of the day was for a strong man to kill off his rivals and rule, leaving behind no one who would challenge his right to the throne, surrounding himself with eunuchs and sycophants. That man represented only himself and his dominance over other men. This practice of deposing your rivals was not just accepted, but expected. In, Roman, in Republican Rome, unless a man's rival was a manifest danger to the Republic, he could be prosecuted for killing him. In Rome, you were supposed to defeat your rivals on the strength of your ideas, your personal charisma, your integrity, and your words. Although Romans, Romans accepted the idea of a man who was first among equals, that man was seen to be stronger for his rivals as much as his supporters. The Roman symbol of power was the fascius, a bundle of birch sticks surrounding a single-bladed axe. It symbolized the strength of the many over the one. When a magistrate was outside the boundary of Rome, the axe was bladed. Inside it, the blade was removed, recognizing that his power over life and death was invested back in the people of Rome. So the fascius represented not just the power of many in one, but also that the one had no power without the many. 
Rome maintained this uniquely high degree of cooperation between men through civil institutions, a rich mythology of political anecdotes taught by mothers to their sons, and traditions conferring manhood on Roman youths by virtue of biological features they shared with other men. But there is one thing in particular that enabled this high degree of cohesion and cooperation, a founding mythology that taught the Roman matron a commitment to not shame her men into games of let's you and him fight. According to anthropologists, cooperative relationships between male humans is one of the features that defines humans as separate from other species, the other being a high degree of paternal investment in offspring. Not only did cooperative relationships between men elevate us up from our hominid ancestors, the only time a society can pivot from one social structure to another, and Rome did a lot of pivoting, is when men are at their highest levels of cooperation with each other. That's the only time we can build new civil institutions, because civil institutions are rules and limitations on men's competition built cooperatively. And the only time that men are at their highest level of cooperation is when women allow them to be so, when women have committed to self-mastery and refuse to draw the lines of shame between men. Civilization comes out of cooperative relationships between men, but women decide when and where men cooperate. And these decisions by women drive the course of human history pivoting from one civilization to another. When killing your rivals makes you lesser as a man, you have to find other ways to defeat them. A court of law, on the Senate floor, in a sports arena. This egalitarian ideal of manhood, enabled by women, Roman women's commitment not to separate men through shame, gave rise to modern civil institutions still in use today. Once again, civil institutions are cooperative superstructures containing men's competition. The Republic of Rome is our template and ideal for civic life. It remains an aspiration. We still live in its shadow, still using its institutions. When we want a code to live by and a standard to live up to, what do we write it in? Latin. Even now. Political expedience and land reform eventually meant that Rome regressed back into investing authority into one man in order to maintain stability. The Republic became an empire, and once again, the archaic authoritarian values of the single strong man were embraced. The essential egalitarianism of Rome had to go somewhere, so it went underground, into an underground religion. All men are one in God. As Rome embraced more and more archaic authoritarianism to stabilize itself, its old values were stamped into this religion. People appealed to a higher authority than men than man to keep their cherished beliefs. And like a terracotta mold, when the Roman Empire had cannibalized itself, its political system slumped into irrelevancy and broke away, leaving this newly minted religious force, the church. For generations upon generations, the church used spiritual belief to imprint, to imprint the social values that enabled an egalitarian democratic republic to exist on a less enlightened po populace even though the software being run during the Middle Ages was less complex and less egalitarian, the church, Christian women, still taught the hardware. Generation after generation punching out underclocked CPUs. Until one day, lightning struck, and we started to redevelop the complex software that social hardware was always intended to run. Secular democracy and republics flourished once again. And then, just like Rome, we became victims of our own success. Unencumbered by an aversion to the material that was rife during the early Iron Age science, we embraced material science and thus eroded the spiritual belief or the spiritual basis for our Christian faith. Our social hardware was in jeopardy. So we developed a stopgap, something to fill the void. Charles Foyer's feminism. Without God, Foyer proposed that societies be judged morally by their benefit to women instead, although he didn't frame it that way. This was already written into Christian scripture with its commandment that men love their wives as Christ loved the church and sacrificed for her. Foyer simply recognized it and codified an already existing spiritual imperative into a secular philosophy that did not need God 
and then that form moral framework consumed Marxism and evolved into the following. Class warfare between men and women, with men always winning. This is why feminism is everywhere, in every institution, be they academic, government, or media. It's everywhere because it's filled the void made by the beliefs we abandoned. It's a way of maintaining the moral superstructure that we need to run our complex society, in the face of the death of God. The only problem is, feminism doesn't work. Roman men achieved unheard of levels of cooperation because Roman women actively chose not to shame them, not to draw the lines, not to to draw the lines of cooperation between men wider than ever before conceived. Christian values are a reflection of the values developed in the crucible of that cooperation. Now we have a large body of women believing that the social hardware they are responsible for creating and perpetuating actively oppresses them, either now or in the past. Shame spurs men to comp competition with each other, but that competition has to be contained within an overarching cooperative superstructure, or it spills out and eradicates order. Due to our feminism, due to feminism, our society encourages no cooperative relationship between men. In fact, it requires such cooperation as sinful, explicitly calling men cooperating and helping each other its version of the great Satan, suspect wherever it appears. Men used to be able to cooperate in service of being women's providers and protectors and adventurers and everything else that men did to ensure progress and prosperity. But after four years, feminism combined with Marxism, men cooperating with each other in the absence of women creates patriarchy, and patriarchy oppresses women. Therefore, everywhere that men, must, men cooperate must be destroyed or controlled. Using the narrative of patriarchy, feminism spurs men to compete in destroying their own cooperative superstructure. Where do you think the postmodernism is coming from? Our social fabric is unraveling, and it's unraveling because women, like Odysseus's Penelope, are actively tearing apart their weaving. Odysseus has come home, but due to feminism, Penelope doesn't recognize him. She sees him as a villain, attempting to ravish her, and so she's stuck in a mournful cycle, tearing apart a weaving each night, with no end, because it's all in her mind. How many women in the world actually understand the role they play in ensuring the society's hardware functions? And how many of those women are in the West? How many women in the West believe that class warfare between men and women with men winning is true? Maybe not now in their current culture, but in their past cultural traditions. You know the ones that enabled us to enjoy a stable society. How many billions, millions, billions of Penelopes are there? not just tearing up their weaving in the West, but smashing their looms, gathering them up for a bonfire, and dancing naked while free bleeding around them. Now, right now, we are one bad harvest from extinction, one economic crash from disaster, and how long will the world keep faith in a dollar backed by a country experiencing endless social upheaval, political upheaval, from all those Penelopes tearing it down? Quite simply, we're at the point where the social hardware we inherited from Rome can't cope, and our fix has driven Penelope mad enough to start tearing it down even faster. The mass of aimless young men subsisting off of porn and games in their parents' basement are not the ones creating this problem. They're the victims of all of this. They've been told to be women's breadwinners, then told the product of their service, a system in which they achieve and earn as instructed, is oppressive to women. And we shame, and we shame, and we shame them some more. Heap that shame on, God knows that won't inspire them into rioting based on simplistic narratives in which they can ease their shame by playing the hero for black people or women or communism or pet rocks or whatever else can take the place of a damsel to save. Let's build that head of shame till every single young man throws himself into the fray to play the hero. That'll solve the problem of young men throwing themselves into the fray. Young men don't need to sort themselves out right now. Older men do, and so do women. We need to sort out what we're telling young men, and we need to do it quickly. Remember when I said that Roman secular values, the values that underpin an egalitarian democratic republic were forged by social customs that encouraged a high degree of cooperation between men? Civilization only pivots when men are at their highest level of cooperation. 
Our solution, therefore, is not to look back at hardware that simply can't do what we're asking for, but to recreate the conditions that made Rome, Rome, in the first place. If we, for a change, stop tearing young men apart mentally with shame and stop making them play our let's you and him fight games, if we build for them a foundation for cooperation, those young men will reward us by building the cooperative civic institutions that will usher us into a new age. Because as Rome recognized way back when by celebrating biological masculinity and anthropologists are only now just catching up with, that's young men's innate nature. So nature to cooperate, to create elaborate systems of overarching cooperation that seamlessly combine cooperation and competition. Look at sports. Look at how often young men invent new sports. Look at the Christmas truce of 1914. Even in the depths of a conflict forced on them, young men tried to reach out and cooperate with the enemy. If you've left foreign, if you left foreign policy to young men, they'd decide everything over a game of Halo. It's the failure of older men and women when young men are in conflict, violent conflict. There are older men trying to ease younger men's burden of shame, and there are women trying to help ease that burden too, and trying to get through to our mad Penelopes. They all belong to one particularly stigmatized group. Men's rights activists. This is a simple and mechanical truth, as simple as fluid dynamics. We need to build a new CPU. We need to go back to the drawing board. We need to understand how our Roman CPU was built in the first place, recreate those conditions, and do it again. Better, faster, sexier. The most valuable person alive today is the young man living in his parents' basement. He still has all the vestiges of the social hardware of Rome, but no investment in our failing society. When someone figures out how to put in place the right conditions and light a fire under that young man's ass, you will see exponential growth, positive change, the kind of change and growth that builds civilization. Light a fire in those young men in the wrong conditions, they'll keep saving Penelope so she can keep tearing apart her weaving and will go down just as fast in a death spiral that no one walks away from. If we get through this, our descendants will look back at this time and boggle at the idea that anyone wanted to stay in the Dark Ages. Because this is a Dark Age. No one ever knows they're in a Dark Age. Because a Dark Age is always judged by what comes next. Free the young men from their prison of shame, and we'll see what comes next. Don't, and everybody knows what comes next. The original version of this video was published with sound problems. In redoing the video, I'd like to take the opportunity to address some comments left on the original. First of all, I've only addressed a few statements by Jordan Peterson. It's already 20 minutes long. If I wanted to address all of them, it would be eight hours. One comment was that I misunderstood what Professor Peterson was saying. I don't believe I did. I do believe that he's saying that Marxism and postmodernism is the driving force behind the authoritarianism and chaos we're seeing in the world today. And this is my counter-argument to that. Another comment suggested I was being unfair and attributing to Rome what should properly be attributed to Persia, and that my history was revisionist. If anyone feels there are some aspects of the Persian monarchy, monarchy that influenced Athenian democracy or had any bearing on the Rep Roman Republic, please put your evidence in the comments below. I'm, I'm all ears. As far as I can tell, the Persian system of government is a universe away from a democratic republic. But I'm open to any arguments to the contrary. The pattern of increased enfranchisement in Rome is unmistakable and unique. For example, the political struggle over enfranchising the Roman allies. In, 19, in 91 BC, the Roman tribune Drusus introduced legislation that would enfranchise all free men in Italy. He was assassinated for his efforts, which led to the social war. Lucius Julius Caesar, one of the consuls who fought in the social war against the Italian allies, proposed legislation to grant the Italian allies who hadn't picked up arms against Romans Roman citizenship, which was done, and shortly followed by another law that granted Italians Roman citizenship whether or not they fought against Rome or not. Would anything like that have happened in Persia? 
I mean, really ask yourself that question. Also, I would advise us moderns not to judge Rome by our current notions of egalitarianism. What's important is the direction they were moving in and the struggles they dealt with moving in that direction. All right. I know our message is not an easy one to digest, but I think it's a needed one. Our young men are not responsible for any of this. They are being expected to lift a weight that they can't lift. They can't choose to turn away from games of let's you and him fight when their el elders and their goddesses are telling them that that's their identity. The way we untangle this knot is to first and foremost stop pulling it tighter. Stop shaming young men for fleeing into the only places where they can enjoy cooperative competition anymore. Stop shaming young men for shutting down under abusive double blinds like being told to be breadwinners for women and then being told that being breadwinners for women oppresses them. Let's all, us women and older men, let's all take a collective step back and a deep breath and ask ourselves, is this really necessary? Is it necessary to keep heaping on the shame, to keep scourging their backs with switches, to keep pushing and 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 then getting surprised and upset when they disappear into porn and games? Let me reiterate. Ambition, risk-taking, daring do, creativity, gentleness, and most importantly, cooperation in all its endless variations of cooperative competition are innate to young men. If these behaviors are innate. These behaviors are innate. And if young men aren't demonstrating it, it's not a flaw in them. It's not out of petulance or laziness. It's because old men and women have failed to give young men hope and have shut them down with shame. I mean, think about it. They got us this far and then just suddenly stopped for no reason and started killing themselves. Let's not do that. Let's not shut young men down with shame. In fact, let's actively come together and push against the people who do shut young men down with shame. And as promised, if you'd like to support a group that's spreading that message, wrong hand, it's somewhere up here, www.feedthebadger.com. Support us and let's get this right. I'd like to thank our patron, Mall a scholar of history who offered some criticisms for the first draft of this piece, as well as all of our other patrons who contributed to the creation of this rebuttal, either by offering their thoughts or being a sounding board so I could practice, as well as supporting me so I could even get up in front of this camera and talk about this. Thank you. when they realized that their working class utopia, when they finally realized after decades of denial that their working class utopias in the Soviet Union, for example, were absolutely murderous and reprehensible empires, they transferred their, their thinking to identity politics and carried on their merry way.